WDBM East Lansing. Welcome to The Sci Files, an Impact 89 FM series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co hosts, Chelsea Boodoo and Daniel Puentes. Today we welcome Nick Young. Nick, can you please tell us about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Chelsea and Danny. So I'm Nick Young. I'm a third year graduate student here at Michigan State University. So I'm actually a dual PhD student. So I'm in the departments of physics and astronomy and computational mathematics, science, and engineering. Thanks, Nick. Why would a person pursue a dual degree in physics and CMSC in the first place anyways? Actually, when I came here, I was not intending to do that. So I was coming here originally just for physics. But then my research kind of involved in the overlapping into that area. So my advisor, who's kind of responsible for all the research I do here, strongly suggested that I look into that path. But I was already going to be fulfilling most of the requirements anyway, so he seemed like you might as well just earn the credit for doing the work. And what path is that? What are you doing particularly with these two degrees? Yes, my work is I actually look at physics education research. So I look at education data collected here by the university. And a lot of that data tends to be pretty complicated. So we need algorithm tools, which is really what the CMSE type work deals with. So the second part of the degree is actually kind of to learn how to deal with that type of data, since I've never really been trained to work with that before. You're using computers to analyze this data that has come out of the graduate school here at Michigan State University. What in the data are you looking for exactly? Actually, right about now is the graduate admission season here. So after you complete your bachelor's degree, if you want to continue on to your schooling and earn a PhD, you have to also apply to graduate school. The data I looked at is actually what students submit on their applications. So it can be a variety of test scores, how they did in their undergraduate program, research accomplished, and really anything else that they've kind of done along their educational career that they want to showcase to the admissions committee here and hopefully get a spot in our program. It's good that there's researchers taking the time to look in what the application data looks like for different students uh, trying to get into graduate school here at Michigan State University. In general, for someone that was interested in applying to graduate school, what are some of the things that graduate school applicants usually highlight in their application? Applying to graduate school is very similar to applying to kind of college as an undergraduate. The big difference, though, is that... Each department kind of controls the process by itself. So as an undergrad, for example, I applied to just a general college. So like I went to Ohio State University, so I played, applied to Ohio State University. But here, coming to Michigan State, I applied directly to the physics program. So it's really up to the physics program to determine kind of what they care about. In physics, the things that are kind of really pointed are how well you've done in your previous work. So taking a, wherever you kind of do your physics work in In the U.S. system, it's pretty standardized of what type of classes you'll take and as well as kind of what tests you'll need to take. So there's a standardized test known as the GRE. So it's kind of like a graduate level ACT or SAT test as well as discipline specific. So there's one that focuses more on general skills like math and reading ability and then one that also focuses specifically on physics. So both of those kind of general tests are taken into account when you apply to a graduate school. And then since physics is a science discipline, the research really factors in heavily as well. So admissions committees kind of want to know what type of research you've done in the past, as well as what you're interested in doing in the future, since a large part of your graduate studies is learning to become a researcher and developing your own work. I like your comparison with comparing admissions for undergraduate college versus graduate college. Like I remember whenever I applied to my undergraduate school, I was just applying to the school and not the program. But... I do know that in physics and astronomy, it's different little subfields within it. For example, we've interviewed people about like astronomy and things like that, and you're doing physics education. So when people are applying to the physics and astronomy program here at Michigan State University, is there a little checkbox or something where people will say like, oh, I'm specifically interested in like education and physics or about like condensed matter or something like that? Or does everyone have a general admission? And then whenever they take that physics GRE exam, is that also general or is it for specific types of physics? One part I haven't talked about yet is just like in undergraduate admissions, you often have to write essays. So there's one kind of known as the personal statement, which you talk about yourself and you can address those research interests you may have. So like, do you want to do physics education? Are you a condensed matter type person? So that's kind of often where it comes out. 
In terms of kind of evaluating that, that's really up to the department itself. So the physics GRE that I talked about earlier is just general. It is supposed to cover all parts of physics. But in terms of thinking like wh whether you're going to be doing a specific area or not, that's really up to the individual department to decide. So some do, everyone looks at the applications while some break it up by subfields. I can imagine that these applications are fairly complicated with vast amounts of information. How are you using computational science to analyze these applications? So we actually don't get the whole application. So part of doing education work is there's a federal law known as FERPA, which prevents unauthorized use of kind of educational records without consent. And there's an office here on campus known as the Institutional Review Board that approves any research we do to make sure we're following federal laws. To comply with that law, we can't actually use everything in the application data. We can really only use things that can be anonymized just so we can't actually look up, say, someone's application. Does the Institutional Review Board at Michigan State filter out these questions that they don't want you to see, or is there like a program that filters it out for you? So far, that's been taken care of before we ever get the data, that we've had some pe great people working with us that have been kind of working in the limits of what we're allowed to do with the law to make sure we're kind of in compliance with everything, but still being able to do this project. Then what does the information that you do get look like anyways? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's just a spreadsheet of numbers. So we have kind of like, here's how applicant 001 scored on this test. Here's how they did in their undergraduate classes. Here's what they, kind of a general area of what they want to study. So for example, like for Danny's application, it would likely say like, I want to study nuclear physics on it. But that's the level of depth that we would have. We wouldn't know really anything more about him. Oh, so you don't actually get access to their personal statements. There's no like certain cues that you look for in applications to predict whether or not the application would be successful or not. Yeah, so not in that depth yet. So we're hoping to be able to start to explore that in the future. But a lot of that is staying within the legal framework of what we're of how much information we're allowed to have without actually kind of talking to all the applicants, especially those who didn't come here and may not, we may actually not have contact information to get their approval. Are people's ages or their demographics something that's included? Um, so no. So one kind of surprising thing is in Michigan, we actually have laws against affirmative action. That again, there's been some lawsuits with the Michigan universities here that it's you're no longer actually allowed to take those into account. So the data I have is actually none of that's in there, just so that way there's kind of no no account from the admissions people that they may be using that or be opening themselves up to that problem. It sounds like then that that information that you have access to is their application number, what fields they're interested in, and whether or not they got in. Yes, along with kind of just their general, I guess, academic performance and also the university they went to previously. So I guess where they earned their undergraduate degree at. I'm not sure if you're allowed to answer this, but what have you found from this data? We recently had a publication that was looking at what actually matters in this graduate admissions process. And what we found here, at least with the historical MSU data, is that it's the physics GRE score, so that kind of general test of, phys of supposedly physics knowledge, and undergraduate GPA, so how well they did in their previous courses at their undergrad institution. There have been studies that have shown that there's a negative correlation with a student's success in graduate school and their GRE score. When you p published this paper, did you also look at whether or not these students finished through their program, and did that correlate at all with the GRE scores? So we don't actually know about that. So this goes back to the kind of data problem and the laws around working with the data, that since it's anonymized, we really can't connect to those students who finished. So unfortunately, we can't actually kind of learn about whether the students who were accepted here, how those scores may have impacted their ability to complete. So that's still kind of an open question, at least here with our work. To go over that, you said that your paper was looking at the GRE scores and the undergraduate GPA scores. There are other things that people take into account for admission into graduate school. You had mentioned stuff like research. What if someone didn't have a good undergraduate GPA and or if they didn't get a good GRE score and they explain it well like in their personal statement or something like what are other factors that can maybe compensate or help them get in still even if those scores aren't good? This is the idea of holistic admission that's really kind of becoming popular in graduate admissions. 
So at the time of the study, we don't actually know whether that was in place. But based on the data, it seems that may not have been the case. But definitely here now, the holistic admission is a lot bigger thing. So we do want to think about the whole application. So even if you didn't necessarily do well on, say, the academic, the academic parts of, your app, of the application, say, you can still be a really good researcher. I think there's plenty of stories of people who may not have been excellent in school that still go on to be great researchers, and we definitely don't want to miss those people. So kind of new work here and actually being kind of a future project is thinking about how holistic admissions works and what's being looked at. So are there specific parts when we're supposedly analyzing people holistically that are really standing out? So are we starting to look at these maybe like life circumstances that could be playing in, or do we still kind of care about those academic parts of their application? You mentioned you're also a student in the Computational Mathematics, Sciences, and Engineering program here at Michigan State University. What techniques do you use in computer science to analyze this information? So the data we have here is trying to understand how humans made decisions, which is kind of a complicated process. So the way we approach this is actually using machine learning algorithms. So the idea here is that there's some underlying pattern in the data and trying to have the computer look at the data that hopefully it can extract that pattern. So it knows kind of the general lay of the land, so it knows it has this data and what the outcome is. And then the goal is to use some mathematical functions to try and generate a pattern that'll be useful for making predictions. So what we can do is we can actually feed parts of the application, so we can pass those test scores, how they did in their undergrad, where they went to school, and their broad research interests, and pass it into an algorithm, as long as whether they were admitted or not, and then hopefully develop some model to determine like, hey, these things are what matters to determining whether they're going to be accepted into this program. Then as a side part, to if you want to see how well your model's actually doing, you have to save some data. So basically you don't want to peek at the answers beforehand. So with this extra data, we can then test our model on it and see how predictive it actually is. So are we just kind of learning the data we have, or are we learning the data we have, but then being able to make good predictions about future applicants as well? Since you are trying to optimize a predictive model, do you feel like this model would be able to help the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at MSU? Like maybe you can run the application through that first and kind of give the people going through the applications an idea about what to expect? Or do you think it would more provide more of a bias towards people that are going through the applications if they had a predetermined score by this algorithm? So we aren't using it on the actual new data that's still all done by humans we're looking more retroactively to see what the people who are making decisions have been doing. So right now we've just looked at the historical data, so it's been a few years back, but even that's been kind of giving some insights about the new process now. So the future work will hopefully be looking at that new process and seeing how to keep improving it to make sure that we're admitting people in the best possible way. And just out of curiosity, how far back does that data go? That's been a challenge to say the least that it hasn't really been centralized here. So for now, it's only been about, I think, seven years back for the data. But I guess supposedly there's more exists, but I guess where exactly that's located is, I guess, uncertain. I ask this because I'm curious about how maybe if world events could have an impact in how applications are chosen. Speaking of world, I was about to ask, what about international students? Do you get the data from international students as well? So I do not actually... There's different requirements for international students compared to ones who are already in the U.S. And since those are different processes, we don't want to be confusing our algorithms of trying to learn two processes when it thinks there's only one. So we've really only been looking at the domestic applicants. So from the results of the publication that you just came out with, what would an ideal student look like? An ideal student probably isn't exactly what the applications are saying, that it's not necessarily someone who has excellent grades or excellent test scores. I think the really kind of important part of being a graduate student is the curiosity and kind of interest in exploring scientific questions. I think a lot of science isn't just being a smart person, it's actually being a curious person, that you want to understand why things work, and that's really what drives you. And I think the application committees are really thinking about that now, too, of what about the actual personalities of the people applying? Like, what's driving them? Are they just great people, or are they people that are actually caring about their science? They want to make a difference. They're really interested in learning and doing research. I would really like to reiterate what Nick just said, that it's not only about your GRE scores or your GPA in undergraduate. 
it's really also who you are and what you've done. There are other things that you do outside of classes. For example, like people do research or community service or they're involved in organizations and stuff. And that brings me to the question, Nick, what drives you? So for my research specifically, I'd say that it's actually kind of wanting to be a better instructor and be learning, I guess, learning how to help people learn better. So that even though, I guess, even though I'm in graduate school continuing on my education, I can't say I'm a person who really likes being in classes. So to be honest, I'd rather be kind of someone who's doing and learning by doing rather than, say, being in a lecture or listening, which is a lot of how my physics classes were taught of a professors at the board kind of writing. And personally, for me, that's not the way I really like to learn. But so I guess kind of thinking that I'm probably not alone in that. There's probably many students who would be preferring a different process for learning, especially physics, which kind of has a, I guess, kind of a connotation that it's going to be difficult or it's going to be terrible. And I guess I kind of, I guess, don't agree with that, that I find it very interesting and want other people to be able to feel the same way. But part of that is changing how we teach it and how, I guess, people are exposed to it for the first time in classroom. Is it this kind of terrible experience where they feel like stupid because they don't understand it? Or is it something where they come in and feeling all curious that they want to learn something new, even if they've never really done any physics stuff before? Yeah, I agree that it can be a real shame if a student's first experience to uh, any field in STEM happened to have been negative just because of how the course was taught by the professor. So it's great that people are interested in understanding how the research can improve the quality of not just the teaching of the subject, but also the receiving end as well to understand what it is and to encourage that excitement for that field. You just mentioned that you were more interested in being an instructor type of style. Is that what you're interested in pursuing after you're finished with your PhD? So I really like doing research and I definitely want to keep moving forward with research, but I do want to be doing teaching as well. But I think it's very important to have people who kind of actually do the research to also be teaching as well, that they have kind of the experience from the field and that should be communicated as well. So I guess kind of my ideal career would be split between teaching and continuing to do research. And would you continue to be doing research with physics education or would you be doing more computational kind of research? I will likely be doing continuing to do physics education work. So one area that's kind of really becoming big is thinking about how students learn computation. The computation is pretty much essential to most STEM jobs nowadays. So even if you're being a physicist, say an engineer, even maybe a biologist, you're going to be using programming. But we haven't really thought about how we teach that. That at least for my experience, I learned programming because I started a project, a project on programming and my advisor said, here's the type of books you should probably be looking at to learn these type of tasks. And that's my experience with it. It's like you said, computation is starting to arise in a variety of different fields that exist in today's society. Something that, that makes me think of, however, though, is if it's such a common thing that is needed by a lot of individuals, why isn't it ever taught in a different type of academic institution? Like, for example, a trade school. Uh, it could easily be argued that coding is its own trade, as in one example. Well, Danny, I actually think that some schools are trying to accommodate with that. It kind of just depends on their funding. For example, my high school back in Miami, we used to be a really small school, but now the school has expanded to the point where they have rooms just with a ton of computers that they're actually having classes and teaching these students from high school now how to code because they're saying if you don't know how to code you won't get like a good job and stuff so they're giving the students the options now but I think it goes even deeper into the system honestly. What do you think Nick? I agree with that that it's definitely computers can be expensive and if your kind of district doesn't have money it can definitely be hard to convince your administrators that you need money for a new program if you're already having problems with what you have. And I guess kind of another way to think about it is also we need instructors to be teaching this as well. That is physics, thinking in physics specifically, even though a lot of us use it, we've never really taken formal classes in it. And we really only kind of know piecemeal parts to do what we want to do. So for example, I'm very knowledgeable about the research I do, but even just kind of broad coding ideas are still very unfamiliar to me. So I don't even know personally if I would be comfortable teaching, say, undergraduate students how to program when I feel I don't even have a very, I guess, deep knowledge of the field. Hmm. So maybe instead of something like trade schools, something more like what Chelsea had mentioned, where you have 
programs to introduce coding in high school like how there is in some higher end institutions. Yeah, and then people could also do what I did. I didn't have that back then, but whenever I started realizing in undergrad that coding was a thing, I started just teaching myself for fun on those, you know, there's like free websites out there where you can learn how to code. But people don't realize that those resources exist. And that's another problem too, is that it goes into funding and then how well that is communicated to the public that this is important and that these are different ways that you can learn it if you don't have the classes available to you or the funds to afford those classes even online. Yeah, absolutely. That I definitely tried some of those free websites, I guess kind of in high school, like this seems really interesting, but I can't say I really kind of learned how to do it until becoming a graduate student, actually having to kind of sit down and force myself to focus on it and actually like, I need to do this in order to accomplish my research. So it can't be kind of like a do it for an hour today and maybe again, pick it up in a week. There was really that kind of formal structure of needing it for my program, as well as an occasional appearing in a class project or something that really helped me learn it. Something I also realized is that an undergraduate, uh, Danny and I both went to Florida National University He and I used to attend free workshops that the engineering school would host that were focused on teaching you how to code. And that it was nice that it didn't matter what major you were and stuff, that you can just go to something. And colleges have things like that. They have clubs and and people that come together to, like, talk about stuff. Like, MSU has the Our Ladies workshops every month or so. At the end of the day, it's really important for public institutions to host these different kinds of programs no pun intended, for people to be able to check out and learn how to code with computers. You've described your interest in formal education research, but are there any other initiatives that you're involved in that span around informal education? Yes. So I'm very interested in also how we kind of communicate science outside the classroom, so these kind of more informal environments like you described. So the main thing I work on actually is also related to physics education research, but it's actually blogging about different papers that have come out. So at least knowing me before I was in graduate school, kind of approaching a scientific paper was very difficult. That It's this kind of long, jargon-filled thing that I'm not really sure what it says or how I go about reading this document. So one of the things I'm really interested in is how to present those research findings in kind of a more general way. So I write a blog of taking kind of current papers and summarizing them down to the current ideas. So if you're not necessarily a physics education researcher, but still interested in, say, applying some of the findings to your own teaching, how can you approach that literature? And one way is through blogs. So just kind of reading, of say, a few minutes a day and maybe learn something new that without having to actually kind of read the full paper and work through all that jargon and terms you may not be familiar with. That's really cool, Nick. What's the name of your blog, and how long has it been around? The blog's title is PER Bytes, and it's been around for a year and a half. So if you're wondering kind of where the name comes from, there's actually a whole group of these so-called byte sites that approach a different area of research. So when I was an undergrad in astronomy, one of my professors actually pointed out one of the main ones known as Astrobytes focusing on astronomy. And I thought, you know, this would be really cool for my own research area. And unfortunately, there wasn't one at the time. So a few years later, I actually created one to fill that gap. Are there any other blogs that you're involved with as well? So I've also written for the MSU SciComm blog here. So MSU SciComm is a student organization focused on science communication. So I've wrote a few pieces for that. Then I actually had my first piece published in one of the Scientific American blogs recently. That's great, Nick. Congrats on your publication. Yeah, thank you. And thank you both for having me today. Thanks for joining us. Hey, do you want to drink some beer brewed by scientists while playing arcade games? Then join us at the first anniversary of the Sci-Files at the Grid on Pi Day. At 6 p.m., we will be releasing a beer brewed at Sagatug Brewery called Diceros. The proceeds go to the black rhino mother, Dopsy, and her calf, Jali, from Potter Park Zoo at the Animal Health Program. It's going to be epic. You're going to get to hear interviewees from the Sci-Files give updates on their episodes, such as the doctors and zookeepers of the black rhinos. It's almost been a year of the Sci-Files. To celebrate the anniversary, we will be giving out prizes, too. See you at the Grid on March 14th, also known as Pi Day.